Uh, my name is Kun Davids. I'm with the, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. I'm very delighted to be here uh, this afternoon to talk about an issue that's very dear to my heart. Uh, and we're going to talk with a distinguished panel on securing peace after interventions. Um, and I'm going to introduce the panelists, briefly introduce them to you. At Melkert, who's a former uh, SRSG in Iraq for the UN, also a former Deputy Administrator of the UN Development Program, former Minister, um, delighted to have you here. Then we have uh, Scott Carlson, former Senior Rule of Law Advisor of uh, the State Department, who will discuss Afghanistan and at will discuss Iraq. And we have uh, Fred Weary, uh, Senior Associate Middle East Program Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who will talk about Libya. Uh, and I think the issues, uh, as you have read in your documentation, um, securing peace after interventions, of course, is not, is not a very easy task. Uh, as we have seen over the past few years, and that's why these cases are so poignant to discuss. And uh, if you see in, in the documentation, we're talking about the challenges that, will, uh, that are being faced after uh, intervention, the degree of institu institutionalization in the cases concerned, partners that do not have the same objectives, and of course, ethnic and religious divisions. I myself, the past week, I read two two pieces that basically triggered some ideas around these cases. The first one is uh, there's a new uh, evaluation study of the Dutch policy on fragile states that I was responsible for for a few years. And uh, it basically is very positive, which I really like, of course. Um, but it also raises the question, what were we actually aiming at? Uh, and were we uh, respecting the rules as set out by the OECD a couple of years ago of dealing uh, on the basis of the, the local context, not seeing a white page, or were we imposing a certain model? The evaluation doesn't really know, and I guess we really didn't know. And then there's the what, of course. Carl Eikenberry wrote a, a piece in the current issue of Foreign Affairs on uh, COIN, and he's fairly critical and basically raises a lot of questions, but one of them is, of course, who was in charge? Was it uh, the local government, local society? Was it the UN? Was it uh, the civilians or was it the military? So there's a lot of issues to discuss and a lot of lessons to be drawn. So without further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Ad, maybe based on some of these issues, to share his experiences with us. You have the floor. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kun. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in this great institute. I remember about 10 years ago that uh, your predecessor Mayor van Aertse, Wim Deetman, came to New York with some ideas about where The Hague should be uh, 10 years from then on the map of uh, international activities and profile. And it's really wonderful to see what has been achieved since, uh, also with your uh, great contributions. And I'm happy to share this uh, with you. Um, on Iraq, um, uh, just to uh, take away uh, any expectation that I can contribute a lot to the overall discussion on peace building, I should say it's a very atypical case. Um, uh, there are uh, today three Iraqs. One is the Iraq that you see on the front page. Uh, it's uh, basically about uh, bombs and blood, unfortunately. Um, second is Iraq that uh, investors know of, Iraq resurging as an economic powerhouse in the region. And uh, thirdly, it's about uh, Iraq politically squeezed at the fault line of the tectonic plates that are clashing already several thousands of years in that part of the world. And all three uh, are impacted by and are impacting the quote unquote peace building uh, activities that uh, have been taken place under the auspices of the UN, uh, the UNAMI mission, uh, ever since the uh, US-led intervention in 2003. But because of the history of Iraq itself in the first place, a country that actually knows a lot longer than we uh, in Europe, uh, let alone in the US, how to govern itself, and because of the particularities of the intervention uh, in 2003 and its aftermath, um, this is not the, the normal peace-building case that you uh, could see, because uh, the origin is highly pol political, uh, the presence is highly political, and the future will be, and it's only going to be more complicated because of the developments in Syria. Um, 
So what I want to do is actually two things. I want to take a look at some of the elements of what we generally understand to be part of peace building, also in uh, reference to the, the Hague approach as it has been uh, presented. Uh, because some of those elements are, of course, relevant to try to understand what has been done and perhaps has been achieved. But also to uh, make some remarks about the politics and, more in particular, the political role or potential political role of the UN, which seems to me highly relevant uh, in terms of trying to think how more stability, peace and prosperity could be generated uh, in Iraq and the wider uh, region. Um, on the, um, say, the more traditional peace building aspects, there are a number of items that I would put above the, the, the line and some items below the line in terms of relative success. Relative successful was the, um, uh, the organization of elections, putting in place some of the political institutions that um, uh, were necessary to provide legitimation to others uh, governing the country uh, after decades of uh, dictatorship. That is not to say that the legitimation of inclusive representation in government and in uh, parliament and in other um, institutions of state is the same as a guarantee to have inclusive participation. The representation has been arranged through elections, and that was indeed a great breakthrough after uh, decades of dictatorship. But the issues at hand today are how to translate from representation to inclusive participation. And I very much subscribe to the point made by Hans Corell this morning that the inclusivity is really at the heart of um, uh, success, and if it's not there, it's very hard to see how you can uh, get there. Yet the very fact that for the first time in um, uh, probably the thousands of years of history in Iraq, all important groups of so in society have a place at the table, I experience myself as something very unique, very important, and very important also to preserve. And I will come back on elections, given also the discussion this morning, very provocative thoughts, interesting, important, in the context of Iraq later on. Second, human rights, mixed, mixed bag, but uh, uh, frankly, a lot better than what it uh, used to be, but it was, of course, dramatically bad uh, before. What I considered one of the most important elements, and there the UN played an, uh, an important role, not by its proactivity, but simply by being there, is the role of media, the role of NGOs, the, the possibility to express, if only within the walls of the compound of the UN, um, but then also supported by um, uh, friends from uh, abroad. And that is something that's not going to get away, uh, going to go away. It's, it's, it will stay there. It's, it's part of the uh, positive heritage of what happened. In terms of building of institutions and capacities, again, a mixed bag. But um, uh, I always thought that uh, the Iraqis actually know very well how to build their uh, institutions. And uh, probably less uh, involvement and certainly interference in that rather than more would help them uh, to get where they would like uh, uh, to be. And economically, um, the, uh, the success is evident. Investors uh, are there in big numbers, particularly in the north, in the Kurdistan region, of course, also given the very specific political and institutional, the semi or the, the almost autonomy of the region, um, which has been a, a big attraction, particularly for Turkish and Gulf investors. Um, but also in the south of Iraq, around Basra, uh, one sees uh, a lot of economic uh, development, a lot of domestic and foreign investors flooding in. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world uh, uh, right now. So we should, not, we should know that in order to uh, also um, uh, try to understand what we see on those front pages when we are, of course, very worried that Iraq is, is now sliding back.
uh, to a situation where we thought it would have been. And that's one of the two elements where it, it doesn't work, it, it hasn't worked really. The security, it's obvious, but it's not only domestic made, it's actually a majority externally made, so it's very political. Um, and socially, the, uh, the uh, incredible inequalities in the, in the country are also part <coughs> of the problem of today and of the future, and in itself also a cause of potential instability. So it's a mixed bag, and it's important to say that, that it's not, not only bad, and it's also important to say that there was a role of uh, the UN, but a modest role, except <coughs> in the um, uh, organization of the elections, when it was essential that the UN was there to break the deadlock in Parliament about a new election law, and um, uh, to, um, how to say it in diplomatic terms, to share with Prime Minister Maliki, as I had the privilege to do, that it was better to respect the results of elections that by and large were fair uh, elections, even if he considered the result of the elections unfair. But I explained that those are two different things. Um, and then the UN is, is, is wonderful uh, to be there. The UN is important by its presence. The UN has very limited possibilities uh, to impose itself in a context that is so political. So let me say something about that uh, side of, of the equation. I would uh, argue that um, uh, indeed 90% of the issues in Iraq are politically defined, of which 80% are uh, externally uh, defined, of which 50% are uh, originating from the region and 50% are originating from outside. Uh, the region, and 5% of that is delegated to UNAMI to uh, represent on behalf of the international community that in the end is unfortunately a bystander uh, in um, the, the big political game that's going on. And unfortunately, I could see a very strong parallel here with what we see today with uh, Syria. Uh, it was heartening to hear this morning the very strong uh, calls on, first of all, to have um, uh, diplomacy, uh, negotiation, bringing um, different parties to the table as the, the preferred, uh, by far preferred uh, option. In Iraq it's actually the other way around. Um, parties have been put together, have accepted to be together, but then didn't know uh, how to find each other in a kind of consensus on the future of society that would be uh, in to the general interest. And that brings me to the discussion this morning. I, I found that indeed very useful to think about the role of elections. I still have difficulties to see how one could do without, because after all, also from the UN perspective, you want to know with whom you have to deal with. And um, with due respect to, to NGOs or other organizations, the, the repre it's very hard to, to see how you can organize representativity from their side. So to have a representation of the people is an extremely important starting point. I was um, also thinking, despite criticism on the hurry uh, with which elections were held in Mali a couple of weeks ago, that it, it, it was understandable <coughs> to try to have some representatives at the table that at least have the legitimation of an election, but it's a starting point. It's, of course, not the end. And one wonders, also thinking about principles in the framework of the De Hague approach, whether a kind of uh, contract with uh, candidates or parties that participate in elections, that they would subscribe to a number of principles of inclusion and dialogue um, in order to put those in practice afterwards wouldn't, wouldn't be a, a tool that the UN could also um, uh, try uh, to introduce even when uh, organizing uh, uh, elections, because too often the story ends with the elections and really it's, it just starts at that point. But doing without is, is very difficult at, uh, at the same time. So let me conclude um, with um, 
the suggestion that if further work will be done on the principles of The Hague, that it would be important to look at the seventh principle, namely how to deal with the politics, uh, which I know is going to be very hard for uh, all of you because you're dealing, uh, frankly, with the agenda of the P5 and others that, um, uh, in the end, define the um, margins and the, 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 the scope of what one could achieve through peace building. That will, of course, apply more to parts of the world where, for all kinds of reasons, this political agenda is so dominant, but certainly in the case of Iraq, um, I suppose also in the case of Libya, tomorrow in the case of uh, Syria, and not to speak of Afghanistan, that's where it all uh, starts and ends, and we too often are too silent about it because we delegate it to the technical community that is technically implementing the peace building, but your margins are extremely small. And talking about the technical community, uh, a final cri de coeur, um, the sixth principle is about the, uh, the, the learning um, uh, side of peace building. Um, please have a look also at the uh, side of the UN staff that is working in, uh, in, these, uh, in this area, in these countries. I've come across many times UN staff that uh, was promoted from Sudan to Iraq in order to see the next stage of their career go to Libya or Afghanistan. And many people uh, just worn out, uh, not connected sufficiently with the uh, normal world because behind the walls of the green zone or the UNAMI compound, you don't see a lot of the world uh, outside. And uh, having your career within those walls, as opposed to the relative luxury of the headquarters in Geneva or New York or other places, is not the way that the UN should organize itself. And it may be a point of attention also for your work program. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ad, for raising a very important points, the role of politics, uh, inclusivity, the external, internal balance, uh, e elections, the UN role, and finally, a not unimportant point, because uh, this is all human stuff, the, the role of UN staff and uh, career patterns and how worn out they are. Uh, we move on to Scott, um, and he can tell us whether State Department people are worn out. Um, and uh, of course, you're going to talk about a case very dear to my heart, Afghanistan. Well, just to answer your question, I, I consider myself a recovering State Department employee, so I'm not sure if that's worn out or on, on the road to recovery or what that boils down to. And before You're building peace with yourself, right? building peace with myself, exactly. Okay. You have to start there. Uh, before I plunge into the darkness, which is uh, Afghan uh, peace building efforts, let me uh, stop for a moment and say that the morning session was fantastic, and I real thank. Thank you to all who participated in that. They set up, I think, a little bit more of a deep dive into country-specific context. And I would note that that was a discussion which 10 years ago would have been hard to have, 20 years ago would have been unheard of. So in the interest of saying there is such a thing as progress, uh, I would laud the morning speakers for their uh, comments and, and the interventions from the audience as well. Okay, what I'd like to do is in a short period of time, dive in a little bit deeper into Afghanistan, and hopefully this will pick up and reflect and echo some of the points that were made this morning. Uh, first, I'd like to set up the context because some of you uh, may not be completely familiar with uh, Afghanistan and some of the international standards that we're developing at the time, uh, but then I want to kind of plunge into two different scenarios that sort of capture some of the challenges of peace building. Uh, to start with, I think it's important to remind ourselves that the international consensus on rule of law standards and peace building were in a state of development um, when the entire sort of Afghan conflict and post-conflict, if you can call it that, intervention occurred. As Hans Karel said, the uh, widely accepted UN definition came out in 2004. The OECD, around the same time, came up with uh, security sector reform guidance. Um, later in 2008, the Secretary General returned to the issue um, and produced the UN rule of law guidance note. 
But in the midst of all this, the Afghans and the international community had to plunge ahead and do their best to try to promote rule of law in the peace building context. On a parallel track, the development community was also issuing some guidance. There was the Paris Declaration and the um, Accra Agenda, and I'll just quote a couple of things from each. Uh, the Paris Declaration said, respect for partner country leadership and help to strengthen, re, no, it was an imperative, respect partner country leadership and help strengthen their capacity to exercise it. Um, and then the Accra agenda in 2008 returned to the issue and said country ownership is key. And I, I think it's very important to note that what some of the speakers this morning outlined is that there has been a coming together of the development and peace building community. It's not quite there yet, but there, they start from, I think, two different sort of pressure points in terms of timing. Peace building is rush, 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 a lot of pressure from P5 states and others. Um, development is, is by definition viewed in a little bit longer term, so it's good to see those coming together. But these competing standards were entering the mix of the peace building process in Af Afghanistan while it unfolded. Then there's the Afghan legal context itself. Uh, the bond agreement that came just a couple of months after the toppling of the Taliban was really remarkable and that it really did set forth a pathway uh, for the Constitution that was approved in the Loya Jirga in 2004. But one has to step back for a minute and remind oneself that that was the fifth con uh, Constitution since 1964. And they were constitutions under very different forms of government. Uh, when you think about the Soviet occupation, the Taliban, uh, the monarchy, and even Afghan legal scholars weren't 100 percent clear what was the impact of this you know, variety of uh, legislation. Did these various constitutions, for example, abrogate certain sections of some of their base codes? And so when the peacekeeping community showed up, there was actually a lack of clarity all around about what the applicable local law was. Also, you had people that were schooled in very different schools of legal thought. Uh, the Minister of Justice that we uh, heard from yesterday, Ghalib, was educated in the 60s and went to Al-Anzar in Cairo and had a very different perspective than someone who was going to law school in Kabul uh, post-intervention. Um, so all of this was taking place and absorbing what I will call as the Afghan honeymoon. So everyone generally, and Afghans included, will acknowledge right after the um, intervention and when the uh, peace builders showed up, there was generally goodwill. There was a friendliness to the atmosphere. There was ability to have a fruitful dialogue. But over the course of six or seven years, uh, the honeymoon came to an end, and then the marital disputes began. And uh, to quote one Afghan uh, senior justice <laughs> advisor who was very much committed to reform, he said in 2009, compared to where we were under the Taliban, we are better off. But compared to what you promised us when you first came, we are worse. And that is what people remember. So to, to uh, hawk the Hague approach for a moment, part of what was missing with strategic communications, managing expectations, and bringing the Afghan community along at the same rate that the international peace building community intended to move. So on to the sort of deep dives about the actual peace building uh, experience itself. At the beginning, there was a very light footprint, both militarily and civilian speaking. And I think there was a general, um, you know, this was, as, as things were moving, I think, relatively well in terms of getting the Constitution and Afghan ownership uh, at the beginning stages, uh, people were optimistic that the Afghans themselves were going to be in the driver's seat. And by 2008, in fact, they did have an Afghan national development strategy, which was no small feat when you, when you consider that it actually was built on ministerial inputs. There was a national uh, justice sector strategy that was involved in a national justice program that fed into that. Um, and then it's like the international community woke up from their slumber. They said, you guys are ready for a big engagement. Let's go. And what did they do? They blitzed 
the Afghan community with conferences. Uh, you had meetings in London, Kabul, Tokyo, Chicago. Um, and what is this doing? This is taking the most you know, valuable senior leadership who are going to be charged with trying to implement this strategy and making them run around to all these conferences and talk to us as international peace builders and donors instead of actually doing what they were supposed to be doing in terms of implementing that strategy. Meanwhile, uh, and I can say this from my own experience, having served in Kabul with the State Department, the U.S. State Department woke up and came up with a number of strategies. They had an Afghanistan-Pakistan regional strategy. Uh, they had the, uh, the CivMil strategic framework, the uh, mission strategic resource plan. There was a counter-narcotic strategy, an anti-corruption strategy, a governance strategy, a rule of law strategy. There's an old adage, when you have too many strategies, you have no strategy. And uh, in fact, when the rule of law strategy was finally finalized, it immediately had to go back to the National Security Council for further review and revision. Um, I could go on, and we can in questions and answers about that. But my point in that is, after a very slow engagement in which we let the Afghans come up with some ideas, then I think as an international community, we just overwhelm them. Um, nevertheless, despite that, they were able to come out of that and still get down to implementation. So that takes me to my next uh, and final sort of deep dive, which is um, um, at a certain point in time, uh, in the 2010-2011 timeframe, the Afghan government realized that they needed to begin to exert formal rule of law um, institutional structures in a number of key districts if they were going to basically secure the state when the uh, U.S. and uh, coalition forces of NATO pulled out. And so what they did was sat down and had a very fruitful dialogue with the international community. And they identified 48 districts that were crucial, they felt like, to projecting rule of law and providing actual services to citizens. Um, and there was a number of international stakeholders. There was the U.S., U.K., Italian, Danish, Canadian, UPOL, UNAMA, ISAF, NATO, um, the Dutch were involved. It was, it was a pretty big, I would say, robust community of, of nations that were interested in rule of law and projecting it. No one disagreed with their choice of 48 districts. It actually uh, coincided with uh, the counterinsurgency strategy. Uh, in many respects, uh, enough so that the, you know, the NATO and the military commanders also agreed this was a good idea. So then it came time to recruit young Afghans and deploy them to these districts. Well, it just so happened that a number of these districts were in the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan. And most of the legal training that has occurred post-conflict, uh, if you will, or post-intervention, I should say, because conflict continues, ha has been in Dari. So in essence, you're taking young jurists and sending them to, in their own words, a foreign country, a foreign village. They're going to show up speaking Dari and dispensing justice in a village where they don't understand the local language of the people, there are cultural differences, um, and they certainly not, might not be welcomed with open arms. Now at this big gathering of uh, international um, supporters, I will say, there was the discussion of, well, maybe you should have mobile courts so that in case, you know, the reaction's not so positive, they can come back to a safe center and you can reassure these young Afghan jurists that they are actually going to be protected for taking this risk to project rule of law. There was not much disagreement with that. But then the question was, well, who would step forward and offer support on that? And there was dead silence. And what the problem was, was that by the time that, and that, that plan took about a year and a half or two years for the Afghans to develop, identify, and execute on, rule of law programs from all those actors I had just described were already put in place and moving off in one different direction. And the disconnect between development and peace building, the, the, the flexibility that has to be peace building, and the long-term perspective about development was hard to reconcile. Uh, all the development contractors said, hey, I can't change my contract and go do this to support these 48 districts unless the bosses back in Brussels or Washington say I can do that. 
and the machinery back in Washington and Brussels and New York wasn't ready to do that. They didn't know how to do it because they were only used to doing certain procurements in certain styles. So when it actually came time where what was potentially an ideal situation, local ownership, design, international support for the same, the implementation was tough. They did a few pilots uh, on their own, got some people out there, but the security threats and that sense of alienation that those young jurists felt led to that venture eventually failing. Uh, so um, in the end, I'd like to answer uh, Ambassador Eikenberry's question about who is in charge and say simply, nobody. And that was the problem. There was no unified way of making decisions even when the Afghans met the international community's rhetorical demands. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Scott, and thank you for uh, thank you for uh, uh, um, uh, yeah uh, telling us this story about Afghanistan. Some of some of which we, of course, all uh, recognize. And uh, talking about communication, and of course, how that should be two-way, which is not always uh, the way it is interpreted. The overwhelming of the international community uh, by the international community in in terms of conferences. You talked about basically the lack of context being being applied in terms of the Dari versus Pashto uh, 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 problem. And of course, in, in the end, it probably is all about a lack of interface with the society where the international community is operating. So, Correct. Okay. Well, before we go into discussion, uh, I'd like to ask Frederick Wery to talk about the case of Libya. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. And I just want to echo Scott's uh, comments about the first panel. I found it really illuminating, especially for the the Libyan context. Uh, I'd like to describe the Libyan context uh, to you and then go into some, some of the efforts of the international community at, at peace building. Uh, I'm going to focus most of my effort, my uh, remarks are on SSR and DDR. Um, we just put out a study for Carnegie on building Libya's security sector. I think there's one more copy there on the, on the table. Um, I visited the country about five times. I was last there uh, this past June. Uh, if you had asked me last year around this time how I felt about the country, I think I would be guardedly optimistic. Uh, but in the wake of my recent visit, the situation, I think, has really changed. And, and I think many you know, commentators uh, are, are describing Libya as Exhibit A for, for state failure. The, there's increased, uh, and, and I think really vicious, political polarization that manifested itself in this political isolation law that was a sweeping measure to... Uh, remove remnants of the Qaddafi regime from government employment, continued un, um, uh, instability in the east, the borders remain porous, uh, ethnic and regional identities are hardening, especially in the east, which was long marginalized under Qaddafi. As a result of that, we've now seen oil production plummet, and of course, the militias remain entrenched and increasingly politicized. Now, underpinning much of this malaise is the lack of institutional capacity, going back to that, that first panel. This is a country that was bereft of any sort of political participation at even the most basic level for 42 years, and we're really struggling with the weight of that uh, legacy. Basic government functions, ministries were, were essentially hollow under Gaddafi, uh, his personalistic, hyper-centralized rule. Um, what you find in terms of donors and outside actors interacting with the Libyan government is, is a real exasperation that there's just no partner on the other side. The ministries don't have the capability. This is also manifested in the country's elected body, the General National Congress, which is increasingly seen as dysfunctional, I think, by many uh, Libyans. Now, in the wake of this gridlock, what you're seeing is the informal sector stepping forward. Again, going back to the, the first panel, tribes, religious leaders, a burgeoning civil society. These actors can get us so far. They've negotiated ceasefire, but ceasefires, but they're not sufficient to, to move the country uh, forward. The absence of judicial structures. I'm not a specialist in, in the judiciary. I think you heard about it yesterday. But again, the absence of these structures has pushed uh, judicial uh, structures down to the local and communal and tribal level. You're seeing this really being the impetus for a lot of communal and tribal infighting, uh, especially in the West and the South. 
Now, underpinning all of this is the much um, maligned problem of the militias, um, the armed groups, roughly 300 of them uh, organized along regional, tribal, and in some cases, ideological lines in the East. Um, the issue of, of militias, I think, really needs to, to be put under a microscope into what we're dealing with today. It's no longer possible to really speak about independent militias. What you have now is a hybrid semi-formal security sector where these militias have been brought under the umbrella of the state. They've been put on the payroll of the Ministry of Interior and the MOD because the state had no ability to project its will, its authority, so it needed to use these militias. This was a Faustian bargain that was done by the provisional government, and the question now is how do you put the genie back in the bottle? How do you regularize these, these militias? How do you move them into the regular army and the regular police? And this is, I think, what uh, the international community, what the U.S. is increasingly focused on, and over the past year what UNSMIL uh, has been focused on. DDR has been uh, halting uh, for a number of reasons. I think primarily because it's a political issue. These militias will not disarm because they still perceive the need of leverage. There's in intense distrust of the central government, uh, its lack of consultation, its lack of transparency. There's an perhaps exaggerated belief that they should have more representation in the government, so they're not disarming. You hear a lot of talk, especially in the East among these Islamist militias, that they're waiting for the Constitution to be in place. Again, going back to rule of law, they want a say in the Constitution before they disarm. At a more basic personal level among young men, it's really about the prestige that they accrued during the revolution, the absence of jobs, the security, and again, the, the fact that the government has put them, these militias on the payroll, how do you wean them off of this? There's intense distrust among the militias, among militia members of the army and the police. Again, that these, are, these institutions are seen as remnants of the Qaddafi era. They're bloated at the senior ranks. And until there's some effort to pension off these senior officers in the army, to restructure the armed forces, the militias have very little incentive uh, to join them. There was a recent move by the prime minister to increase the salaries of the police and the army to try to entice these militias uh, uh, to join. And indeed, now the average monthly salary in the police and the army is more than the militias. But that said, it remains to be seen if that alone is sufficient because these militias, as it stands now, they don't do a lot of work. I mean, they kind of get, they're on the payroll. Why would they give that up to join and experience the privations of, of military life? The, talking again about, about local ownership, um, the Libyan government, I think, had a, a very well-meaning effort at DDR called the Warriors Affairs Commission, set up under the last prime minister. It was an attempt to register all of these militia fighters to identify them for movement into jobs, scholarships, to give them loans uh, for small businesses, again, to reintegrate them into society. What happened? It fell victim to political infighting, ministerial infighting. It was seen as being tainted as a Muslim Brotherhood initiative. Again, going back to that broader political problem. When I talked to the UN uh, in Libya about their views of the Warriors Affairs Commission. They said they had trouble supporting it because it had no backing from the government. Again, that idea of lack of, of partnership. Let me close with some thoughts about what the, what the international community is doing. I think UNSMIL, again, initially was focused on the elections last year, and, and, and rightly so. We can get into this issue of sequencing. Perhaps there should have been more attention early on to the security sector because that was left somewhat on the back burner, these militias were able to entrench themselves further. But the elections, by every account, were a success. In the past year, UNSMIL has really focused on the security sector. But again, it's really about uh, ministerial restructuring. It's about presenting plans. It's about coordinating uh, different uh, international um, uh, efforts. What we've seen now in the past several months, uh, and I'm speaking here from a, from a Washington perspective from the U.S., is an emphasis on training a new Libyan army, a new security force that came out of the G8 meeting. 
Uh, obviously, the U.S., British, uh, the Britain, Italy, Turkey have signed up on this to train what's called a general purpose force, a new military force, essentially from scratch, outside of the country. The idea being that this force will come in and it will appeal to some militias that they will want to join it. It will give the Libyan government a stick to compel the militias to disarm. I think this logic is somewhat flawed because unless there's a parallel process of DDR and especially national dialogue, those fundamental reasons for why the militias are so entrenched will not be addressed. And we're talking here about rule of law and the country could be thrown, I think, into, into deeper uh, strife. Again, you train these men overseas, these soldiers, where will they come back to? How will they be absorbed? There are all sorts of questions about vetting, about mixed recruit, recruitment of battalions, lessons from the Lebanon case. Um, I think ending on a positive note, there has been an initiative now for national dialogue. Many of us were, were advocating this for quite some time. This is a positive step. But again, there's already criticism from a number of quarters in Libya from tribes that, that Zaydan took this initiative without consulting them. So we're getting back to this, this boogeyman of lack of transparency, lack of of consultation. And I think no matter how the national dialogue uh, unfolds, there, there will and there must be a role uh, for UNSMIL because of the lack of capacity of, of the Libyan government. So I'll close there. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And I, I, th I think uh, in spite of the fact that, uh, that Ad, of course, said uh, the Iraq case, for instance, is unique, you do hear a lot of cross-cutting issues, and I'm sure they were also raised this morning, uh, issues including uh, how to, how to uh, cater for inclusion, how to get that going, uh, the unavoidability, but also the complications of elections, uh, the lack of leadership domestically, but also on the part of the international community, and in the security sector, of course, the problems of militia, which are uh, often set up with certain purposes, but end up doing something else, and reintegration is then practically impossible. We found in Afghanistan, for instance, that militia members at a certain stage earn five times as much as local police and then to tell them would you please reintegrate into the police force becomes a bit of a complication. Well thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank our panelists for, uh, for this, this good discussion where we raised all kinds of issues on, on the what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve it as I phrased it at the start and of course the holy grail of ownership uh, institutions and inclusions they're still out there. Uh, we're in the 101st year of the, of the Peace Palace in The Hague uh, and I think taking on the, the challenge of peace building uh, the way we're doing today uh, in the end can only be instrumental uh, to, uh, to that cause we're looking for, uh, inclusive peace. So thank you very much. There's a break now until uh, 4 o'clock, coffee and tea. Thank you.